I'd like to welcome you all here today. It's a, it's a way of starting the, uh, the new academic year. I think in many ways, 2013 to 2014 was by far our best ever year. Uh, I think we were kind of overwhelmed by how many uh, activities we ran. I think it was something like, I, th I would guess about 40 something events over the last uh, year. We had, uh, we broke our records in terms of audience numbers last year with multiple events with 100 plus um, uh, joining. It was also probably our best year in terms of uh, teaching. We had our best ever um, uh, number of students taking uh, our, we've got about seven uh, Taiwan uh, courses. So we're very, again, we're very excited about uh, the start of uh, this, uh, this new year. And I think book launches are a great way to get, uh, get started. Book launches are celebrations of the really hard work that it takes to actually put together, particularly an, an edited uh, volume. Uh, and anyone who's been through that process will know what, uh, what we mean. Um, the, the book that we're launching today is Political Changes in Taiwan uh, under uh, Ma Ying-jeou. Uh, that's been edited by uh, Jacques Delisle, who's, who's here, and uh, Jean-Pierre uh, Cariston from uh, Hong Kong Baptist University. Uh, I'm here in, in a number of, um, uh, number of titles. I'm the um, uh, editor for the Routledge Research on Taiwan Book Series. Uh, and I'm also, um, I also have a chapter in, in this, this book. Uh, this book is uh, the 12th uh, uh, book in the book series, uh, and the 13th one has also uh, come out uh, this summer. The book series has only been going now for, I think, about three to four years. So I think over three to four years to have um, produced 13 really high-quality, peer-reviewed um, books. I think it's really, really quite, quite an achievement. Um, and I think for those of you that have been to uh, some of our book launches over the last uh, two to three years. I think you get some kind of sense about how vibrant uh, the, the series is and, and, how, uh, and how diverse. Um, and of course, we do have a number of forthcoming uh, books. I think in 2014 we've got, uh, yeah, for 2014 to 15, we've already got confirmed, I think, four uh, volumes that are really exciting. For example, Fan Union's new book on Taiwanese uh, social movements, Simona Grana's book on uh, environmental politics and and John Lee Yu's um, uh, uh, book is also coming out. I think in in the spring of uh, of next year. So we have uh, a lot of book launches to come, and maybe there'll be some uh, some more because we've got a number of, um, of books that are currently un under review. So there's a lot to uh, look forward to. Um, so what is what's so special about uh, uh, this book, um, Political Changes in Taiwan under Ma ying well, I think there's a number of things that I think particularly stand out uh, for me. Um, the book deals with a really important question for political scientists, and that's the impact of changes of ruling parties. Um, and, and we have seen a number of really significant changes since uh, 2008, since uh, the KMT came back to power. Um, and this, I think, is a really interesting question. It's something that a number of really good uh, books in the Taiwan Studies field have dealt with. For example, uh, in 2006, 2006 two, uh, we published a book, What Has Changed? Taiwan Before and After the Change of Ruling Parties uh, in, uh, in 2000 that John Lee and I edited. So it, it, it's, and also in 2008, a very similar book uh, came out uh, called Presidential Politics, edited by uh, Steve Goldstein and something done, which uh, looked at um, let me see, the second Chen uh, Shui Town. So I think this, this is a real nice um, uh, kind of follow-up on, on those two, two volumes. Um, as political scientists, we're really interested in the impact of changes of ruling parties. Uh, for example, uh, Samuel Huntington talks about the two turnover tests as a way of judging whether a democracy is really consolidated. In Taiwan, we've had two changes of ruling parties already, and um, almost, we've almost had two others. So elections are really competitive. So I think so re Taiwan represents a really good test case um, for the impact of changes of ruling parties. Uh, and this is a, a, a theme that we will continue to look at um, uh, over this year at, at SOAS. We, we, are, we are looking to have a, a um, journal special edition that again looks at this question, impact of um, 
change the brewing party, but from some different angles that's edited by Minier Rawls. So that's something that will be coming up either late this term or early next uh, term. Um, okay, there's some other things that I think are really special about uh, this book. One, I think, is the, the chapters. The chapters are, are really interesting for a number of reasons. Um, uh, firstly, uh, as a number of you know, monthly is our deadline for MA dissertations. The, uh, um, and when I was uh, looking back at the, uh, the chapters, I noticed that a number of these um, really address some of the topics that some of my MA students um, are working on. On social movements, for example, um, on party change that Jason's looking at, um, and, um, and also uh, the impact of ECFA. And uh, so uh, uh, I think it's quite possible that, that some of my students are going to be uh, looking to, uh, to buy uh, <laughs> this, this book. I know, I know at least uh, one has been talking to me about buying two copies, which I think is quite, quite amazing. Um, I think another reason why I think this, um, this book is wonderful is that it addresses a number of, of, of badly neglected issues in the field of Taiwan studies. Uh, so, for example, there's the chapter on uh, Japan-Taiwan relations, which we rarely actually see. I think I'm only aware of one or two other uh, early attempts to look at this really important uh, question. There's also a chapter that looks at the way that the um, uh, Taiwanese <coughs> parliament deals with um, agreements with the PRC. And again, the importance of this is really being reinforced by the Sunflower uh, Movement. There's a chapter that looks at the development of social movements uh, in, in Taiwan. Um, uh, since my year came to power. And again, the Sunflower Movement really reinforced how important uh, uh, this is. And I think it's also, I also like some of the, uh, uh, the choices of authors. Some of these authors really actually get involved in these kind of edited volumes. Um, uh, one that particularly stands out is Nathan Batter. So uh, again, it's a name that my students know very well because we, uh, he has one of the best blogs on Taiwanese politics called uh, Frozen Garlic, which is um, uh, it's fantastic, but he doesn't really publish enough, so I'm really glad to see he's, he's got involved in this book. Um, and of course, those of you that have been involved in some of our seminars over this last year will know Richard Bush, who was the de facto US ambassador uh, to Taiwan, and one of the uh, few people like, like me who actually has Taiwan studies in their, uh, in, in their job title. Uh, he's talking about US-Taiwan uh, relations, something that he talked about when he visited uh, saw us uh, earlier this uh, this year. Um, I was the one author in this book that didn't actually join the conference. But when when I heard about the um, um, uh, uh, the contents of this, I just had to get get involved. So I was the one who um, um, uh, I, I did deliver my, my manuscript uh, on on time. I think another thing that I have to add, having edited. Uh, books uh, before uh, is to praise the efficiency of the two editors. Uh, the uh, initial conference was held in May in Hong Kong uh, of 2012. And to, to, to get a turnaround, to have a peer-reviewed book to come out within two years is a real achievement. I think if it hadn't been for one or two troublesome authors, it could have been even uh, uh, even uh, even earlier. Um, okay, so. The way we're going to run uh, this session, um, next Jack is, Jack is going to talk a little bit about the overall uh, book, and then he's going to talk about uh, his chapter. And then I'll talk uh, a little bit about uh, my chapter, and then we should have a fair amount of time uh, for Q&A. Unfortunately, we only managed to get uh, two of us uh, here. Chris Hughes uh, seems to be um, away. But I think it means we should have enough time for Q&A, and then we've got time for more discussion. Uh, over wine and, and, uh, and coffee. So, um, uh, so now let, let's give a, a big start of welcome to uh, Jacques de Lille from the University of, of Pennsylvania. Well, uh, thanks, and thank you for that, for that really uh, kind uh, introduction. Um, uh, you know, you can doubt when people introduce a great book in their own series, <laughs> but, uh, but I can assure you it is completely objective despite the, <laughs> the series that is included in the chapter. Uh, in terms of the, the quick turnaround, um, I should probably fess up, so I'm probably one of the troublesome authors. Uh, but one of the other things that contributed to getting it out quickly uh, was Rutledge, which just did a terrific job, and Hannah Mack just did a terrific job of getting the, the book out in, in timely fashion. 
Uh, I've edited a few volumes over the years, and this has been one of the most efficient in terms of just general turnaround and uh, resilient in terms of dealing with the problems that inevitably come up. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the book and get copies available. <laughs> All right. Uh, Basically, the, the, the idea behind this volume was uh, that we're going to look at Taiwan at a time that was sort of a political crossroads. And in many ways, it was. The crossroads not just politically, but, but in areas that had something to do with politics. Uh, so in politics, narrowly defined, as, as Stefan has alluded to, in 2008-2012, we saw uh, two elections that, that marked a milestone collectively, right? From KMT power to DPP power back to KMT power. The alternation of power the political scientists. Uh, point to as, as, as they just heard. And what seems to be through the playing out of the constitutional reforms that were adopted in the mid-2000s, a consolidation of much more of a two-party system with the real marginalization of, of the lesser party. But there were still, get that back up, please. Gotta keep the ad. Uh, can I do that? Yeah, well. It's showing up on my screen. Yeah. Oh, there you go, I think it also has been master once well. Um, but the question is, at, with all that behind us, well, what do things look like ahead? Uh, Mind Zhou has chronically low approval ratings, and that's likely to be the case for the rest of his term. Uh, the KMT has been internally fractious uh, throughout much of this presidency. Note, for instance, the Mind Zhou Wang Qingping dust up uh, and the Sunflower uh, movement to some degree as well on that. Um, the, the questions of, of how much and how quickly the DPP can recover, is it really going to be viable in 2016? These are all questions uh, we're going to see in the near future. Uh, and there is the, the question about whether the long-anticipated turn of Taiwan party politics toward things that have less to do with cross-strait relations and more with the ordinary issues of economic development, social policy, and things like that, whether that will finally start to take hold. Economically, um, the Ma administration began amidst the global financial crisis. And Ma ran very much on a platform of economic recovery, restoration, of course. And there's been a recovery, but it's been kind of slow. It's been a period of, of Taiwan entering international trade agreements external trade agreements uh, in a way that it had not been able to do before, starting with ECFA and some of the doors that that has begun to open. But we're still now looking at the consequences post ECFA of, of deeper economic integration with the mainland, how fast that will proceed and what its political consequences will be. Uh, issues of inequality have been rising, issues of sustaining growth remain there as well. As well. Socially, as uh, Chris Hughes' chapter examines this, this question of Taiwan identity and Taiwan uh, culture, uh, is, is still very much on the table. It's been, a, been playing a very different role in policy under Ma than it did under Chan, of course. And social movements, as, as, um, as uh, Humming Cho's chapter gets into, um, have, have taken a new turn and become somewhat more active under Ma with the Sunflower Movement, which happened right as this book was in the editing process. Uh, we snuck in a few references to it. Uh, uh, I think we did, didn't we? Yeah. The, um, um, uh, um, you know, that, that's become a, a question of, of, of where we're headed on that front. In terms of foreign policy, of course, the Ma years have been marked by a real bounce back, a recovery in U.S.-Taiwan relations after the nadir they had reached under Chun, particularly with the 2008 U.N. referendum. And uh, cross-strait policies, cross-strait uh, uh, relations obviously have warmed greatly. Uh, Taiwan's gained in terms of international space, uh, the diplomatic truce in terms of, of the mainland poaching, Taiwan's remaining diplomatic partners, and so on. But it's still somewhat questionable where this will go ahead. The dictum of first easy, then hard, first economic, then political becomes rather difficult when you work through the easy and the economic. And we're starting to see those issues loom on the rise, and particularly with pressure from the Chinese side to turn toward at least cultural and social, there's been some progress on that, and maybe ultimately toward uh, political. And we don't really know where Xi Jinping is headed. He's still fairly new in power, of course, and the initial signs have been very much continuity with Hu Jintao power. Uh, the past period of, um, of policies, but is that going to change as he gets uh, further into his term? What are the fallouts of China's problematic relations increasingly with the United States as the U.S. pivots, or as we now like to say, because pivot sounds threatening, rebalance uh, toward Asia? Uh, neither one may be credible, but that's the language. And what will be the fallout of, of the East China Sea, South China Sea debates and things like that? So there's a whole long list there, and I'll say in a few minutes a little bit about how some of the chapters look at that. What I want to stress is this is a book that both looks back over the Ma years and tries to find the roots of Ma era policies, partly in continuities with the pre-Ma period, and partly in a reaction against China, and what we're seeing by Ma and his crowd as, as uh, really quite bad policies. But it also looks forward. Uh, every chapter says something about what to expect for the remainder of the Ma years, 
which aren't quite as long as when we started the book, but there's still a couple left. And I think in all cases have implications and sometimes quite explicitly drawn implications for the post years, speculating on the consequences of a DPP victory uh, or a KMT continuity in office. So let me spend just a few minutes uh, giving you a quick overview of uh, the book. Let me say one more thing generally about the book, which is, as, as Jeff has referred to, there are a lot of things I think are, are fairly remarkable about this volume, uh, self-serving that may be, but one is that it really is a, a truly international collection of scholars. We have Europeans, we have people from both sides of the strait, we have a, a Japanese contributor, we have Americans, North Americans. It's really a, quite, a, quite a diverse set in terms of origins and places of work. The types of issues listed in the book's lengthy subtitle, looks like I've got the cursor arrow on it, uh, I think actually are what the book talks about. Uh, that is, it, we cover partisan conflict, policy choices, external constraints, and security challenges. And in that rubric, there are chapters that look at questions of identity, policy, and institutions. Uh, chapters that look at contentious policy choices on matters ranging from economic and welfare policy to social, uh, many things that social movements take up, to cross-strait policy and foreign relations. We talk about external constraints that stem from Taiwan's relations with the mainland, with the US, with Japan, and Taiwan's more uh, complicated in some ways status in the international community generally, including its engagement with international organizations. Uh, and, this, and we also have uh, sections that look at national security challenges that come largely from that external environment, but also have some domestic policy and even demographic roots, declining population and so on. Uh, despite that rather large grab bag of topics, which the lengthy subtitle is meant to capture, I think uh, there is some coherence here. In the, the title actually does weave all the chapters together. together. That is, um, well, this really is a book that is very much about political changes undermining Joe. That is, we talk about background, we talk about the future, but it really does look at the Ma years. And it looks distinctively at political questions. Many of the chapters look, are specifically about politics in the ordinary sense domestic politics and also the politics of foreign policy, but the chapters that look at other things like economy and society look at the political consequences of social and economic factors or at the politics of social and economic policy, what shapes those policies. The chapters on national security, external relations, and international status tend to stress the political aspects of Taiwan's relations with the outside world or the domestic political foundations of what Taiwan is doing externally. Now let me give you about a five minute summary as it were of some of the chapters. Just to go quickly through it, uh, Nathan Bateau has a chapter on the elections, particularly the 2012 election, comparing it to the 2008 election. He says this is your classic maintaining election. It really continued trends from pr prior periods. The greatest predictor of 2012 was really 28, uh, 2008. Uh, that is, um, uh, what you see is a cleavage structure that remained largely unchanged, and policies toward the mainland were the defining issue. There were some changes around the edges with the other factors that political scientists point to, candidate quality issues, uh, that were new issues and such really didn't do the work. Uh, then there's this chapter by this uh, fellow named Fell. Um, you know, it's not one of the best ones in the book. <laughs> it's, it's actually an excellent chapter, uh, which we were delighted that he was able to submit despite our inability to lure him to the conference. I think he'd already committed to another conference at that point, otherwise I'm sure he would have been there. Uh, quick footnote on that, though, Jean, I had dinner with Jean-Pierre in Hong Kong a couple weeks ago. He regrets not being here, but wished us luck on this book launch. So uh, David's chapter, we'll go into it in detail, but basically it, it's broadly consistent with Bato's in saying that the characteristics of a party system have become pretty clear and constant through the last couple of elections. And what you see is patterns of party fragmentation toward, strongly toward a two-party system, and patterns of ideological distance widening between the two parties. That predicts some continuity ahead as well, although I think Fell's chapter more than Bathos thinks there's room for change, a little more agency as it were, and less determination. Uh, and looking to the future again, both do suggest continuity, but some opportunity for change. The next chapter is then turned to institutions, from party politics to instead elections to institutions, with uh, Dai and Wu looking at the very passive role, the surprisingly passive role, given the constitutional allocations of power, of the legislative yuan in looking at cross-strait agreements. Why is that? They say basically it's a, fact, it's a function of the KMT united rule, party and parliament securely in one party's hand, and indeed a supermajority in parliament for much of the period. Uh, a positive executive legislative relationship. That's not that mind Joe and Wang Jinping got together. It really is more a point of undivided uh, government. Um, and the idea that the, 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 the um, decision making on policy, is particularly cross strait policy, was highly centralized within the KMT and largely in the hands of Ma and those immediately around him. Uh, and also that the, the issues they look at, which are cross strait relations, probably reflect a broad truth of comparative politics, 
which is executives, presidents get more deference on external relations than they do on domestic policy. Looking toward the future, uh, basically the value will think it's going to depend on whether a unified government continues and whether there is a moderately uh, strong leader within the KMT. The next uh, cluster of chapters turn to economy and society. Doug Fuller looks at the impact of ECFA, and he says ECFA has not done much and should not be expected to do much, at least relative to the hype. So whereas Ma and the KMT uh, said that it would uh, it would be a centerpiece of economic policy, it would lead to increased growth and probably increased equality, that hasn't panned out, and nor have the DPP's worst, crit worst criticisms about how it would hollow out industry, lead to significant unemployment, and fatally increase dependence on the mainland. Who knows what's going to happen way down the road, but so far uh, not that much in Fuller's analysis. He's got a lot of data to back it up. Basically says ECFA's limited impact is due to the fact that ECFA didn't do that much. It wasn't a radically liberalizing agreement. It didn't really take down too many protectionist barriers. And because it is a gradual phase in, it's going to take a long time uh, for even what is in there to come fully online and have full effect. Much of Taiwan's uh, economic issues, its economic and social uh, related social issues, lie beyond ECFA's reach, uh, fuller stresses. Uh, he thinks there's nothing in ECFA that's going to change the basic bipartisan commitment in Taiwan to a developmental state and to relatively protectionist policies. Uh, he also says that there is no stomach so far among the two major parties to push very hard on the kind of welfare policies that, unlike ECFA, actually could deal with inequality in Taiwan. Hongming um, uh, Shou looks at uh, the question of social movements under Ma and uses a political opportunity structure analysis to say that social movements, particularly liberal or left-leaning social movements, have resurged under Ma because they face a moderately hostile environment. More hostile than under Chun, but not so completely hostile as to make them not viable. So the idea is that Ma's government has leaned right on social policies, and this has created demand uh, and, and the sort of energy behind movements. But Ma has not fundamentally betrayed openness and democracy in Taiwan, so there's still space for these movements to operate, uh, and that because these movements don't have the year of the Ma government, they've looked elsewhere, and the DPP, out of power and looking for support, has been relatively receptive. Chris Hughes looks at cultural policy. Um, he says that Ma has <coughs> re-identified Taiwan with China from the Chen Sui Bin baseline to a point that went beyond what you needed to secure the median Taiwan voter, and to a point beyond what Beijing really required to maintain a cooperative and patient approach on cross-strait relations. Ma has overdone it in that sense, if you take those as the metrics. And uh, uh, Chris says that this must therefore reflect Ma's ideological preferences, or perhaps the desire to satisfy the deep blue wing within the KMT. This comes, Hughes tells us, with risks to Taiwan's domestic politics and external relations. It could erode democratic consolidation because this is such a hot button issue. It could erode Taiwan's international stature because anything that re-identifies with China risks undermining uh, the stature that Taiwan has gained over the last uh, couple of decades. And it could create instability even in cross-strait relations because the mainland will overread how much any sense of Taiwan's separateness has climbed back down in cultural policy. Uh, toward the future, um, uh, you know, those are the risks as, as uh, Hughes' chapter uh, sees them. The next, the remainder of the book, and, and Chris's chapter does this to some degree, it pivots us a bit to cross straight external issues from domestic issues. The remainder of the book is primarily about external issues. We have a pair of chapters, one by Liu Fuguo from Taiwan and one by Chu Shulong uh, from Beijing, from the mainland. Uh, and they, they have actually quite similar analyses of the progress or trajectory of cross strait relations under Ma and likely for the remainder of Ma's term and beyond. Uh, for Liu, Ma has accomplished much in reducing tensions, enhancing, enhancing cooperation and institutionalizing cross-strait ties, uh, combined with a hedging strategy of, of re-establishing ties with the U.S. and to a degree with Japan. The O attributes this to Ma's cautious and pragmatic policy approach, and the Hu Jintao and now Xi Jinping's administration's willingness to be patient and to shift from reunification to anti-secession, provocative though that may have been, and to uh, accept the 92 consensus as a basis for moving forward. Uh, so Leo says, going forward, we'll see moderate incremental progress. <coughs> We're not going to see radical changes. And even incremental progress is imperiled by Ma's weaknesses, including his weaknesses as a political leader and government manager, uh, and the strident and effective opposition of the DPP. Uh, Chu Shulong from the Beijing side uh, of this, this uh, cross-strait view of cross-strait relations finds foundations for rapprochement in Beijing's shift to the 92 consensus in uh, more broadly China's pursuit of a peaceful development strategy that extends the peaceful development of cross-strait relations. 
Um, and uh, in Ma's rejection of Chen Shui-bian's cross-strait policies. Here, too, the view is one of prospects for moderate progress during the remainder of Ma's terms, but it's going to be limited. And here, Chu focuses on factors rather different from those of the other stresses. Chu says, basically, um, there are going to be no big breakthroughs because Beijing doesn't expect very much. It now understands the domestic political constraints that Ma faces, particularly after the Hoping Xie Yi does stuff. Um, secondly, Beijing recognizes that there's a lot of slack left, a lot of steps to be pursued in terms of economic relations and social and cultural relations. So the big ticket sovereignty and politics issues can still be postponed. Um, and uh, Beijing is also worried that any consents, any, any, um, uh, any um, uh, accommodations uh, that it makes, any concessions it makes on politics toward Taiwan are going to be grabbed by a DPP administration that might win in 2016 not be so trustworthy in Beijing. But. The next pair of chapters, getting near the end here, a look to Taiwan's security environment and national defense policies. Udrin Bakker discusses the factors that affect Taiwan's external security environment. And here, there's a lot of you know, modest uh, progress, but still persisting limits. So she points to the US's pivot or return to Asia and the improvement in US-Taiwan relations as helping Taiwan's security. But it's not clear how durable that's going to be. Cross-strait economic integration has been good for now, but could it be used later to uh, extract political concessions uh, from Taiwan to coerce without using force? Confidence-building measures have been pretty modest. So she says going forward, uh, it's going to take a lot of work to sustain these gains, get, given the inexorable drift in the cross-strait military balance in uh, the mainland's favor. Although here, China's bad relations with its neighbors may actually perversely help Taiwan. Uh, because everyone is hedging against uh, an increasingly assertive China, and therefore more likely, in effect, to share Taiwan's views of the dark side of cross-strait relations. Uh, Lin Chen Yi then turns to uh, internal factors that affect Taiwan's external relations, covers some of the same ground as Wacker, but adds that uh, a lot of what's been going on here in terms of uh, the, the difficulties Taiwan has faced in security policy are the factors of domestic choices in, uh, in that area. So he points to the problem of assigning the military to what the, uh, the guns and bombs people like to call mutwas, military operations other than war. So disaster recovery, uh, you know, that kind of thing, that, that distracts and degrades um, uh, the ability to perform traditional military functions. The all-volunteer military, politically very popular, especially with young voters, not the best thing for force preparedness, uh, most people would say, um, and failing to consummate the arms purchase with the US and generally to increase defense spending as has long been promised. To the future, um, Lin says that these are pretty, these are indicative of some pretty uh, lasting structural features, but there's still room for political choice and maybe Ma or his successors can do a better job on these issues. Uh, three, three last chapters to touch on briefly. Uh, Richard Bush assesses the rebound in US-Taiwan relations during Ma's tenure and says this has been terrifically positive. It's improved US-Taiwan relations, the improvement in cross-strait relations has taken uh, the pressure off of Washington has been very supportive of how uh, developments have occurred across the strait. So the politics of the relationship is good. The economics are a little weaker. Uh, how do you like Raktokami painted beef? Not your best food, perhaps. I know that's become a trade, a trade issue. TIFA and, our, and uh, TPP uh, are just not moving forward at a pace that Taiwan had hoped, and those seem hard to solve. Looking ahead, Bush says, don't worry about the abandoned Taiwan thesis. That's academic chatter. Uh, policy intellectual chatter, uh, that it's not going to happen. It hasn't changed the US's basic policy orientation. And indeed, the commitment is stronger under Ma than under Chun because it says that, that Taiwan will blow up the relationship has faded. Um, and uh, because Taiwan is not the only problem in US-China relations. If it were to go away, other problems would be there. And abandoning Taiwan would worry America's allies in the region about America's commitment to them. So there's no real good security reason for the US to abandon Taiwan. Looking to the future, Bush says the most likely scenarios for the medium term in cross-strait relations are continued slow progress or a slowdown. Both of those are better for the US, he says, than crisis or rapid progress on Beijing's terms, which the only way rapid progress is likely to occur. Hirosahashi then uh, takes us into Japan-Taiwan relations, a little discussed subject, as, as that was pointed out. And he says here, too, it's a somewhat similar story. Like US-Taiwan relations, there's been great improvement during the Ma years. The strength there, however, has been the economic relationship. Uh, it's been a real bright spot, and it's been uh, reinforced by cultural and social ties, including, and he has an interesting discussion of this, including the shared sympathy that came out of Fukushima and Maraka. Uh, the cooperation between the two countries, and indeed the two societies that came out of that, was seen as highly positive, although there's been a couple of 
uh, political aspect somewhat mishandled. The, poli the political side of the relationship has been somewhat more troubled. So here is the mirror image of the U.S.-Taiwan relations. It's good on economics, weaker on politics. The political side is, you know, Japan just doesn't want to get near this whole issue, right? Uh, when you're dealing with China in the way that Japan is, it's a little tough uh, to go too far down the path of, of uh, dealing with, um, with uh, Taiwan in ways that suggest closer uh, security alignment or cooperation. Um, and there is the Senkaku Gyalu. Senkaku Gyalu Gyalu Tai. You know, you've got to call it three things. Those pesky little things in the East China Sea that stick up above water and cause so much trouble. Um, you know, there that has obviously been something of a problem because the ROC line has been very close to the PRC line in terms of uh, Taiwanese sovereignty, or sorry, Chinese sovereignty over the islands, or whatever non Japanese sovereignty over the islands. Um, and Ma's dissertation, of course, had appeal to the flames as far as the, the Japanese are concerned, and they've given his background. Uh, but by and large, uh, it hasn't been as bad as one might fear because the East China Sea Peace Initiative has put some distance between Taiwan and Beijing on that issue, uh, and uh, because the fisheries agreement that, 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 that they were able to forge works for both parties. Uh, it, 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 it's cooperation that sort of shoves Beijing's claims a little bit to the side. Uh, final chapter I'll mention here before turning to a quick summary of my own uh, is uh, Sigrid Winkler, who talks about Taiwan's pursuit of participation in international organizations. Taiwan's attempt to join more and more, especially those UN-affiliated and therefore in Beijing to state member-only organizations. And here she studies the WTO's government procurement agreement, a follow-on to the basic WTO agreement having to do with, with how governments purchase goods and services, and the WHA, the World Health Administration, uh, World Health Assembly, rather, uh, the sort of meeting side of the, the, the WHO, uh, and the international health regulations. And, and of course, these are successes, of, in a sense, during the Ma years, and the Taiwan gained access it had previously been denied. But, she says, these may, looking ahead, prove to be Pyrrhic victories because Taiwan could only get observer status in the WHA, which, you know, which is kind of a weak and again, conditional status, uh, and Taiwan had to accept terminology uh, that, that eroded uh, the, at least the, the um, more state-like references uh, you would see in the terminology used during the Chen years, and it had to acquiesce in Beijing being the gatekeeper to Taiwan's um, uh, access to these organizations. Looking ahead, um, uh, Winkler says, um, uh, we can't necessarily play out these examples very far. Beijing has said these have, as the lawyers have put it, no precedential value, right? Each organization has to be taken on its own terms. All right, that was a busman's tour uh, through our book. Now you, don't, now you still have to buy it because you want the details, you want the footnotes, you want the subtlety of argument, you want to be able to report back to the authors how badly I butchered their work in my story short summary. Um, let me turn now to, a, to a, a little more detail on my chapter, which is the last one in the book. Um, editor's privilege, um, on Taiwan and soft power, and it's about cross-strait soft power competition. Now, I'm not a huge fan of soft power as a concept, but it's current enough that then I think it has some utility, at least as a, um, an analogy or a metaphor for what goes on cross-strait. So soft power, or the ability of a state to get what it seeks through normative appeal rather than coercion or economic side payments, uh, matters in cross-strait relations and in Taiwan's quest for security. It's a concept that, of course, started about the United States, but the idea of soft power, of winning without using force, of course, has deep roots in Chinese political thought all the way back to ancient times. Um, and it's been a part of uh, cross-strait, uh, sorry, it's been a part of, uh, yeah, of cross-strait relations for quite some time now, uh, at least back to when Jiang Bingwu realized he needed to democratize to keep the U.S. in play, uh, and, and uh, as contrast began to be drawn across the straits on these issues. Soft power is also a weapon of the weak. That's W-E-A-K, not the weapon for the third week of September. Um, it's a weapon of, of the relatively weak faced with the strong, uh, and it serves largely defensive ends and uh, sort of pushback against, uh, against threatening forces, uh, certainly for Taiwan, but I'd say also for China. And soft power is ultimately a relative asset who has more, and a relational asset. Can I, do, can I use it to persuade you in some sense? So if we look at the soft power um, structure, I'll say a little bit about the Chinese side of it and a little bit about the Taiwan side of it. Um, what we've seen is, is a rise in attention to and thinking about and policy discussions concerning soft power along with China's rise in hard power. So a lot of hard power accrues and they start saying we need to talk about Ryan Shidi, right? Um, and, and other similar terms. What does China's soft power consist of, at least insofar as it's relevant to cross straits in Taiwan? Well, a few things. China, the China economic model, right? A fearsome uh, tool for economic development. Uh, something which survived the Asian financial crisis and the global financial crisis, which laid low China's neighbors and then uh, the economic superpowers. It's sort of the, the East Asian model on steroids. 
Um, yet it's got its limits. Uh, Chinese sources are very reluctant to articulate a Chinese model for a whole bunch of reasons. It's hard to define, and if you define it and somebody uses it, it fails. That's been a problem. Um, and um, there is also growing doubt about how, how robust the model is as China's growth curve flattens, as uh, readjustment seems to be necessary, and as the political stability side of it may come into question. Secondly, foreign policy. Here, China's soft power consists of depicting itself as a singularly benign great power. Right? China will never be a hegemon. It was a victim of colonial oppression, so it would never oppress others. As a developing country, its, its pr principal priority in foreign affairs is a peaceful environment in which to pursue development. In other words, don't worry. Everybody should just chill. Um, and that, of course, is an agenda which, which uh, gets reinforced uh, by uh, soft power um, and tries to develop soft power. And it, but but um, you know, there's, there's a limit to how far you can go with that. So we've seen some struggling. So we've seen, um, how do you feel about flipping the issue? How do you feel about a peaceful rise? Well, that's a little threatening. All right, let's fall back a peaceful developed clipping time. Well, that may be a little tough, too. So how about a harmonious world, right? So there's this quest for the benign-sounding uh, phrase. It's kind of like pivot versus rebalance. Um, it, it, it tells you that something isn't quite sticking. Some of that's aimed for Taiwan, particularly the peaceful development across great relations. Uh, you see also some attempt to portray China's benign stance on Taiwan in, uh, in the granting Taiwan as Beijing sees a greater international space and accepting the 92 consensus um, uh, in the diplomatic truce and so on. But it has its limits. It can't get rid of the 2000 white paper or the anti-secession law um, or the push for uh, considering uh, political uh, talks as part of the discussion. And you especially can't get rid of the perverse consequence in the cross-strait con uh, context of Beijing's usual deep commitment to anti-interventionism, right? So part of Beijing's benign soft power strategy abroad is we, unlike the Americans, don't muck around in other countries' internal affairs. We don't invade them, we don't try to remake their governments. Well, that's all well and good, but of course, if it's Beijing talking about Taiwan, that's an internal affair. It's aimed at the US and others saying, keep out of our internal affairs. So that little piece has a boomerang or a perverse effect in the Taiwan context. And of course, the China's problems in its maritime periphery and with the US have kind of uh, taken the, the bloom off the benign power uh, rose, at least for the time being. Thirdly, uh, political, internal politics as soft power. Here, this non-interference pluralism stuff, in terms of the international system, everybody can have his own domestic politics, it's sort of the, the domestic face of what I was just talking about. Um, well, again, that's got the same problems as what I was just talking about, and I think it's fair to say that Beijing's political brand, the Chinese political model, and like the Chinese economic model, doesn't get a whole lot of followers, uh, much of anywhere except maybe Pyongyang. Um, China's uh, culture is the fourth element, and there's been a specific attempt to say cultural soft power is an important part of soft power. You see it all the way with Hu Jintao and, and Xi Jinping uh, and others talking about it. Um, and here you see things like um, uh, the Confucian resonance of the harmonious world and, and uh, harmony of diversity. You see the charm offensive stuff that people used to write about, the advent of public diplomacy, CCTV all over the place, the Confucius Institutes. These are all very much cultural uh, gambits. Um, and of course, it is especially powerful vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan because of the assertion of the Chineseness of Taiwan, so it brings it inside that umbrella. Here too, there are some limits, of course. Um, you know, uh, greater cultural and social contract across the Straits has had an ambiguous impact, an ambivalent impact, on Taiwanese attitudes toward China and Chinese culture and who bears that culture. Uh, there was a constituency for desinicization, right, Chi Chu Jung on, on the Taiwan side. Uh, and by and large, there are sort of, you know, problems with Chinese soft power here too. The Confucius Institutes have gotten a lot of blowback. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Ai Weiwei and others are sort of you know, counter-cultural, if you will, uh, cultural icons uh, in, in China, modern Chinese culture, contemporary Chinese culture. Um, so let me turn quickly to the Taiwan side of the story. To a, to a shocking degree, it mirrors China's soft power. Uh, partly that's happenstance. What are the resources or potential resources of soft power for Taiwan? Partly it's, the, it's a game, right? It's, 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 it's a contest and a struggle where Taiwan has to respond to what China is up to and vice versa. So economically, Taiwan has a pretty appealing model, right? The East Asian model is one of the four tigers that got this whole thing going. That's all been very good, but, you know, and it's done it with democracy and relative equality and all that stuff. It's pretty appealing. But it's pretty small. You know, it doesn't loom large the way the US or China or somebody else does in the international consciousness. And for developing countries, Taiwan's growth miracle was a long time ago and far, far away. Uh, and what now is a pretty anemic growth rate. It's, it's just not stirring 
uh, uh, emotions the way it might once have. Uh, instead, Taiwan's economic soft power has converted much more to an argument that Taiwan plays by global rules. It's part of international supply chains, it lives up to market standards, it, it, it's a good WTO member, it's part of the club. It's not stealing your jobs or engaged in unfair trade practices of uh, the way uh, China is. Now that matters not for developing countries so much, but it matters hugely for the developed world. Japan, the US, and others, and that's the constituency where this soft power battle is really being fought. And you see this notion of, of this global norm embracing going all the way back to the Yang Pei and the, global, and the uh, guidelines for national unification. You see it with Ma's pursuit of TIFA and TPP in a slight bit of opinion. For an affair soft power, well here Taiwan flips what China's been up to. Taiwan says, if anybody is going to upset the international status quo, it's not Taiwan, it's Beijing. So this quest for state-like status for security inside the international system, uh, this long ongoing quest joining every organization that will allow uh, Taiwan in, uh, behaving like a state, signing on to the human rights covenants, at least through domestic legislation, all these kinds of things, uh, stressing the sort of uh, you know, alliance of democracies, it's at least part of the TPP and things like that. Um, all of this is, um, is, a, is an attempt to sort of uh, look like a, a normal and pro-status quo state. Uh, and that helps make any attempt to disturb the cross-trade status quo as something, the blame for which goes uh, to, to Beijing. And here under Ma, there has of course been a retrenchment, right? We're no longer doing Bibi and Equal, or, or, uh, or uh, now, well, look, there are two state pieces. It's not, that, it's not that kind of separation, there has been backsliding, but you still got the mutual non-denial, uh, the three no's, um, the quest for international space, and the quest for maintaining diplomatic relations. Um, and where Ma has strayed even farther from his predecessors, he's had to be in a hasty retreat. So Taiwanese policy has remained relatively robust in protecting this state-like status such that uh, China is the one uh, upsetting uh, the international arrangement if it tries to pressure Taiwan into a settlement as opposed to China's view, which is Taiwan's trying to break away and therefore upset the norms of not, not messing with existing states. So we saw the, the peace accord being dropped, the liberal talks being dropped, and things like that. Uh, next to last, uh, in terms of internal political and legal order, I've touched on this a little bit. Uh, Ma has certainly continued his predecessor's pattern of stressing the importance of Taiwan's democracy and Taiwan's human rights as soft power values. It makes Taiwan a beacon for China and change. He said it explicitly in his inaugural. And it, it, it plays very much to the US. Again, this goes all the way back to Zheng Jingwu. Uh, but it, you've seen it throughout administrations, into the Ma administration, stressing the milestones of democracy, stressing the progress Taiwan has made. And sure, there are bumps in the road. You know, legislators hit one another. Legislators hit one another with chairs. Students <laughs> occupy the legislative yuan. You know, red shirts show up in the streets. Right? Uh, these things happen, but by and you know, people say like, elections are illegitimate. Um, but by and large, Taiwan's gotten through all those. And every time it gets through one of those, and in effect makes the argument stronger, and the mainland is no longer beating up on Taiwan's democracy and its propaganda as much as it used to. Mm -hmm. um, and here Taiwan benefits not only from its own accomplishments, mixed though they are in some respects, it benefits from the mainland's utter failure, I mean, the collapse of its soft power as, as a sort of political model, and the apparent abandonment of the reforms that had been achieved. Uh, you know, when you jail somebody like Liu Xiaobo uh, for Charter 08, that's really kind of a bad contrast with, with the claims of, of uh, democratic constitutionalism on the other side of the street. Last, finally, uh, culture. Taiwan's played tit for tat here. You want a Confucius Academy? How about a Taiwan Academy? Uh, you, know, uh, you want to, uh, to have John Yimou do the 2008 Olympics? Well, here's uh, Warriors of the Rainbow. <laughs> and they're, they're the, the, the Venice film, that's why there are all these attempts to get these other, these other cultural things out there. This, of course, you know, it's worked reasonably well, but again, Taiwan is too small to be a huge cultural power. And there is a problem that the two ways of defining culture have problems. One is to emphasize the Chinese side, which Ma has done, but then you're not differentiating from the mainland and you risk feeding a mainland culture argument. The other is you go with aboriginal culture in Taiwan, which is part of the Warriors of the Rainbow, and you know, Chen Shui-bing used to hang things in front of Chiang Kai-shek's face at the memorial, <laughs> the canoes and stuff. Um, but of course, that's not the culture, meaningfully, of the vast majority of, of Taiwanese who are ethnically Han. Um, so there's that, uh, that. So I think, you know, in the end, basically, um, to, to butcher Hobbes, uh, when nothing else has turned up, clubs are trumps. Uh, but where institutional restraints on use of force are extremely thin, as they generally are in international relations, hard power matters, right? The clubs do matter, Hobbes is right. But since Taiwan doesn't have any clubs in its hand, it's playing hearts.
You're trying to play diamonds too, but now the main line's got more money. I'm sure they're essentially appealing to, appealing to values and to the, the squishier things. That's, that's not a great strategy, but it's the best strategy in a bad situation <coughs> given the assets that Taiwan has. And it's especially an important strategy for the third party audience here, which is the US. And if you look at US foreign policy, there's been a deep ambivalence throughout American history between realistic power-based national and <coughs> security type thoughts and values ameliorative, you know, sort of Wilsonian versus the realist stuff. Um, that's still there. And uh, Taiwan can play some to the hard edge side of things, uh, but it can play much more effectively to the value side of things, and that's why I think soft power uh, competition across the straits is likely to be with us uh, for a while, and it's a game that uh, Taiwan is wise to play, even if it's uh, some one that's playing, some, one that it sometimes plays with a weak hand. Thanks. and cooperation within a, uh, a political system. So we, when we look at party systems, we're looking at all the relevant parties together rather than individual single parties. Um, we tend to look at um, party system change through a number of, of angles. We look at fragmentation, the number of relevant parties and their relevant sizes. We look at their ideological distance, the, the way that they move towards the center or towards the poles. Are they convergent or, or divergent? Um, we also look at the interrelationship between political parties. Are they uh, hostile, antagonistic, or are they cooperative? For example, if we think about the Long Way era, we think about those consensus-seeking conferences that really uh, allow Taiwan to, um, to democratize and have a blueprint for a uh, multi-party democracy. And then there's kind of the three kind of dimensions that I look at in, um, uh, in my chapter. So how have things changed? Where, where did we start from? So if we think back to 2008, the party system looks something like this. Um, we had quite polarized political parties. Uh, if we think about national identity as a, as a uh, policy spectrum, we had the uh, DDP um, moving to the uh, center towards the far left of our, of our spectrum, talking about uh, almost back to its position in, in the early 1990s. Uh, and we have the KMT uh, again talking about unification, one China, um, and re-embracing some of those old Chinese nationalist symbols, Jiang Kai-shek, for example. Um, we had, uh, as Jacques mentioned, we had uh, fights in, in Parliament. So we had very, very um, antagonistic inter-party relations. Um, and from around um, mid-2005, we have a trend towards a two-party system. Um, uh, and it's really kind of um, clear when we look at the election results in 2008, when all the small parties are wiped out. Perhaps we could even say it was more like a, uh, at least in, in terms of um, uh, seat shifts, it looks almost like a, uh, a one-party dominant uh, system, at least uh, initially. So what's happened since that, that picture in 2008? Well, in many ways, I think we've seen a lot of continuity. Um, I would say that the parties are as far apart as, uh, as ever. There's been some attempt at moderation in, in, the, in the case of the, of the DDP. But I would say that the KMT has probably shifted even more uh, to, the, um, to the right towards um, uh, unification and closer relations with, with China. And, and this is something that, that came out in our analysis of the, of the 2012 uh, election. Um, in terms of the inter-party relationship, I think it's just as, as hostile uh, as ever. And again, we, we've seen that in some of the, um, um, in things like parliamentary uh, clashes, lack of real inter-party negotiation. Um, perhaps the one area that, that, uh, where we do see some signs of change is in terms of fragmentation. Uh, in, in 2012, some of the smaller parties did manage to get through that 5% threshold. So, so for example, the um, um, Taiwan Solidarity Union, the PFP, managed to win a number of, uh, of seats. 
Um, and this kind of brings me on to one of the, I think, the really interesting contradictions that we're seeing in the, um, the Taiwanese political scene. Um, when we look at the overall party systems, what we, I, think, I think we've got a similar kind of trend in Japan and perhaps South Korea, is a, a trend towards uh, uh, dominance of two mainstream political parties. Okay. Um, but when we look at public opinion, um, we've got very, very low trust rates in mainstream political parties. Really strong alienation uh, with the, the major political parties. I mean, for example, if you think about the, the DDP, um, unlike the KMT in 2006, the DDP doesn't really yet look like a party that's um, waiting to come to power in the way that my India was in 2006. Um, the fact that Sujan Tan, for example, resigned after Sunflower does show something, I think. Um, so in other words, the KMT is extremely unpopular. The DDP hasn't really kind of um, uh, taken it, its place, at least not, not yet. Um, a few months ago, I joined a, um, a seminar on the Sunflower movement. And uh, during the seminar, Juan Bortan raised the question about how many of you are satisfied with the mainstream political parties? And I think almost everyone said, said no. <laughs> um, uh, and I think this says something about the, for example, the state of the, the, the <coughs> DDP in theory should be really fitting, uh, fitting into this gap. Another key element of that seminar was the number of people who were calling on them to create a new political party. So, I, so for me, I think one of, um, uh, one of the interesting tests of development of the party system is what's going to happen in November 2014 when we have a, a lot of local elections both for executive and for uh, uh, city, uh, city and county councillors. To what extent will uh, third forces actually make an impact? There's, there's quite significant nomination of the smaller parties, including the Green Party, which I'm doing some uh, research on. So I think this could be really quite interesting. Um, how the, um, whether we see any shift in the, in the, in the party balance. Uh, last time in 2010, there was a, a rough 50-50 balance between the KMT and the DUP. Will we see this um, in, um, uh, in 2014? From, from, from what I can see, um, there's probably going to be some space for smaller parties, but there will be some challenges. We will actually come back to this topic in about a month's time when one of my students will be talking about the, um, uh, the development of the Taiwan Solidarity Union, and I'll talk about the development of the Taiwanese uh, uh, Green Party. But I think it's definitely something to uh, to look out for. I, th I think on, on that note, then I think we should move to, uh, to Q&A. I would like to uh, start. Uh, yeah, Mike and then Nick. Nobody's been to so far the anti-nuclear movement, which in terms of last year's demonstrations, he pretty much equaled the sunflower in turnout. And a very wide spectrum of, um, of class members. Um, how has that played into the political system in the months since last uh, March? Um, okay, let me say a few <coughs> things um, on, on this one. I mean, this is a, this is a topic that um, uh, for example, Simona Grano is particularly interested in her uh, uh, forthcoming book. She's, she's spoken on this a couple of times at, um, at, at SOAS. Um, I think in many ways the anti-nuclear movement um, has benefited from Fukushima. I think that, um, um, I mean, if you look, for example, at public opinion, uh, and uh, there's a really amazing shift. If you compare public opinion on fourth nuclear power station in uh, 2000, 2001, with the, uh, the last uh, two years, especially since Fukushima, there's been a huge shift. Um, so I think that's, um, it did come up in the 2012 elections, um, when Taiwan did use a uh, kind of nuclear-free homeland. Uh, Ma managed to kind of defuse that issue by talking about phasing out one, two, and three. Um, but I think it has grown as, as a movement. We saw that in the way that it, it emerges towards the end of the Sunflower movement. Uh, and the fact that uh, there was a kind of compromise 
on kind of stopping construction, at least officially temporarily, but would they really, really uh, restart? Um, another thing that, that strikes me, at least from, from my discussions with people who are involved in this movement, is um, <coughs> uh, the gap between them and the DDP. I mean, a, a lot of environmentalists that I talk to really hate the DDP and, and feel that they were kind of let down by the DDP when it was in power. Uh, so I, I think it seems to become a much uh, broader coalition. Um, um, will it be a big issue in, in, the, in the future? I'm not sure. It seems to a certain extent to have been diffused with that kind of uh, recent compromise. And much more your area than mine, but a, a couple of things. I think in, in terms of some of the things that, that go on in the analyses of the book, it's an interesting test case for close uh, social movement mm -hmm. um, thesis because, you know, on the one hand, it is an issue that has gained some salience, and, and I think his depiction pretty plausibly is that um, is that social movements, of course, represent whoever they represent, that they catch fire or not mm -hmm. uh, based on some degree of, of resonance, and that's sort of the from below organic side of it. But, but there's also this question about how do they link up with political parties? And on the one hand, you know, there is this long-standing DPP uh, willingness to be somewhat critical, right, the fourth and third power and so on. Uh, but there has been this, this real disappointment by environmentalists and, 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 and such, but, you know, weak, perhaps, the DPD, but weaker than they are on a lot of social justice things, despite, despite telling one the uh, hoping Johnny, which always sounds to be like a new stop on the MRT. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think it's really interesting to see, uh, I mean, I would say the issue has become far more salient over the last, um, two years than it has been at any point, perhaps since 2000, 2001. Um, and I think that is quite interesting. The fact that the KMT has been forced to compromise when it wasn't, wouldn't in, in the past, uh, I think is, is really quite achievement. I think it's, it's clearly one of the strongest elements of this uh, kind of social movement scene. And how much of that do you think is the, the social disillusionment with both political parties, and you're talking about popular mm -hmm. disillusionment with both political parties, versus the sort of special quality of nuclear issues post Fukushima. I mean, um, probably, you know, the, the issue is it's a probably some both. I think it's definitely uh, part, of, part of both. Uh, oh, yeah, and, and Nikki. It's really a practical question. I mean, you were talking at the beginning when you were saying about how we put the book together, and this has been, been a process that's happened over the past two years. So I was just wondering, really, that what you would perhaps add what would you like to see perhaps being entered in the book if it was to be something that was to be started now, knowing what's happened? You know, this obviously was still within his within his terms. Is there anything perhaps you maybe you would change within your own within your own work or anything that has that you would like to see being added if it was something that you were to begin now? Uh, you put me the tough choice of saying, of course everything in the book is right, or is it <laughs> and here's where we need a second edition of <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I think, I don't think anything has changed profoundly. I mean, I think there are, are uh, recent developments that one would want to incorporate and have some of the authors address. I mean, the Sunflower Movement mm -hmm. is probably the most obvious one because it, it has clear implications for the social movements chapter. Uh, and it clearly has implications for uh, Bato and Fell and their chapters on, on the party. Well, may or may not, but at least it's something worth, worth chewing on about what that, what that, not only what it causes, but what it reveals about uh, Toward politics. Um, you know, periodically over the years in Taiwan politics, it's these eruptions of youth participation, right? And wild strawberries. And, and um, you know, that, that resonates in a funny way for me with the discussion of the all volunteer army in that chapter. Uh, you know, if, if kids really are, younger people really are a more volatile political force, you know, that, that seems, to, it, it, I'm surprised at what, what seems to be the lack of a consistent perception of the importance of that phenomenon in Taiwan politics. Like everybody ignores it until it comes up and then and political leaders seem to react. Um, in terms of the external relations things, um, you know, we have more data now on how the, how the change in leadership on the mainland uh, plays out. I don't think it would fundamentally change any conclusions, but you know, we have the third plenum, which is not a law on foreign policy, but at, at least it sort of sketches the line a bit more clearly. And I think, um, although on cross-strait policy, Continuity has been remarkably robust, despite you know some return to some of the less talk politics stuff. Uh, that has not been caught in the wake 
of the general toughening line on uh, pursuing Chinese interests and, and standing up to members on the other side of, of disputes. Um, one last thing I'll say on that is I think one of the really interesting moves, which was only, which is still pretty co if not on the book went to press, at least wasn't the analysis, you know, being done rather than simply tinkered with as, as he can at the last moment, uh, it, is what to make of, of the daylight that the Ma government has put between itself and Beijing on the territorial plane. Uh, it's partly a broken relationship I'm interested in, but, but I think you know, for, for years, one of the things that complicated Taiwan's relations with Japan, that complicated its attempt to stake out its separate existence in international space, was that it was quoting chapter and verse from the PRC handbook, which was the old ROC handbook, on, uh, on the, the maritime territorial plane. And now with, the, with, with a shift to something that sounds much more like US policy, Follow international law, resolve the issues peacefully, um, and and um, and Beijing implicitly, somewhat so the budget of Beijing, you know, being really uh, assertive on this, and then the ability um, with that creation of some space to forge a fisheries agreement with Japan and to forge a deal with the Philippines over the killing of Taiwan fishermen. Those are both things which improve Taiwan's relations, or at least, you know, undo not only undo the immediate damage, but, but I think help build a uh, potentially stronger longer term. Uh, foundation for those kind of relationships and on the old status game it helps because all you know fisheries agreements typically with countries, with states enter enter into to one another. States protect their nationals abroad, right? So contrast the fisherman incident with the handing over of uh, uh, the question of handing over the, the several Taiwan in Manila. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think this is, this is a, um, uh, a great question. I mean for uh, I think the sunflowers is, is, is one. I mean we just had a few references uh, um, but I think it's very uh, it's a little bit too early to judge what's the, the impact. I know at least one of my students is writing on, on this, and we, it's it's quite speculative. And we'll, again, we'll get a bit of a, a sense in, in the November uh, elections. Yeah, we'll get the November election. I know <laughs> that would be great. Um, but uh, uh, with elections, we're always waiting for the next one. So. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> and unfortunately, in Taiwan, you don't know the result beforehand. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's right. That's well, that's why Taiwanese politics is, is, is so interesting, full of, always full of surprises. Um, do, does Chris talk much about education reforms in his chapter? But I think that might be yeah. an interesting thing to. Not very much. It's mostly about Ma you know, and, and cultural policy in Chinese, mm. as the anti Chun, you know, the. Because uh, the, uh, I think that would be an interesting thing to, to look at, because we do have this idea about uh, reversal. And the degree that he's reversed, kind of, uh, uh, to, to actually brought China back into uh, curriculum. So that would be one thing that I think we just need to look at. Another one I think that's come up, particularly in the sunflower uh, period, was um, the relationship between Taiwan and Hong Kong. I, I, my sense is that Taiwanese are much more interested in Hong Kong uh, now than they were uh, than they were in, in the past. At, at the very moment when Beijing is doing its best to in some ways, you know, make the, the one country, two systems model of practice in Hong Kong not terribly. It's never been very good, but completely unappealing. The, the, the moment for Taiwanese to be refocusing on Hong Kong, right as Beijing says, the chief executive the electoral rules are going to be you know, pretty constrained, which I don't think is surprising in wake of the NPC interpretation on the, the request for democratization back nearly 10 years ago now. Uh, but it still was a, another you know, nail in that. A final thing I, I would add that I think would be interesting for uh, future research is looking at the impact of administrative change. In other words, if you go back uh, to the, um, uh, in terms of domestic reform, what, what's Mars done? What, what has Mars done? Um, domestically, very little actually. I mean, the, and one of the few big things I can see is uh, city mergers. Uh, um, I've never really seen a really good academic paper on, on, on that topic, just as I've never seen a good academic pa paper on the impact of getting rid of the um, provincial government. And I think that would be a really interesting comparison with the, the uh, actual impact there. I'm sure there'll be, a, uh, there'll be a lot to say on that. Okay, we've got uh, Abib. Oh, and uh, Oh, I, I just want to ask you a few questions. So, based on your observations, do you um, is there any commonality or uh, changing trends uh, in the two terms of Mars? And I think that's uh, probably something you can look forward to in the future, or at least can mold it over uh, when you're thinking about political changes in, in, in the market. Another is 
what's your view of uh, a Scottish referendum that <laughs> resolved um, Taiwan and, and the, the uh, cross strait relations? I mean, that, of course, that's just a fun question, but at the same time, I think everyone's keeping their eyes on the result. It will dim Taiwan's chances of getting into NATO. <laughs> <laughs> um, should we take Jillian's one as well? Okay. Yeah. yeah um, thank you for your point on the uh, multi authors, how you talked about their position that Taiwan joining these international organizations as Chinese Taipei actually does not help Taiwan's sovereignty as far as ROC is concerned, because my thesis is on cross trade relations, and all of my arguments apply in Wu Yusan's power symmetry approach that by joining organizations under Beijing, satisfying Beijing's conditions, Taiwan is actually giving up its sovereignty as an ROC, so to speak. So going back to Nikki's question about following up with the volume two and what other issues are to be explored, since the 92 consensus is more than 20 years old, it qualifies as history, so to speak. So I'm just wondering whether we should take a more revisionist approach towards the 92 consensus and what it actually means for Taiwan. Because my argument was, during the Bill Clinton administration, he sees this as an opportunity to exercise pragmatic diplomacy and expand Taiwan as the way he interprets it. But unfortunately, as far as Beijing is concerned, since Beijing represents one China and OCRI is one China respective interpretations, everything has to be done according to Beijing's hegemonic discourse across the straits. So I was wondering whether we should just look back towards it and see, since it's been 20 years, what it means for Taiwan and its sovereignty as the RFC. Thank you. Um, um, okay, we've got one more then. Hi, I'm a student at the IOE, and I'm very happy to be here today. And I have one, uh, have two questions. Uh, I'm quite impressed uh, that in the book uh, you mentioned uh, you, uh, you analyze some um, the Taiwanese topic from a political, economic, societal, and foreign affairs perspective. But I'm wondering why, why uh, there's, uh, but why you uh, find it seems that you just mentioned that you see the uh, foreign. Uh, foreign relationships with Taiwan and Japan is mentioned in the book. But how about the Asian countries? Because we know that Asian countries, they may, uh, they have uh, an agenda that they are uh, going to unite, uh, have, uh, have an organization such as EU uh, in 2015. And I'm wondering, is that going to impact Taiwan or not? Because it seems that most uh, professors now, they are focusing more on the Taiwan relationship with China or Japan or those Eastern countries. But how about the Southeastern countries? And this is what I'm uh, quite curious. And the second question is, uh, I'm very curious about uh, why, why you are interested in uh, Taiwan relate, uh, related topics. Because, <laughs> because, uh, I'm, because uh, Taiwan is, uh, is eager to include international students. But most of the international students are mainly from the Asia. And I'm very curious why, why uh, Western people uh, why Western researchers like you are so interested in Chinese topics? Yes, thank you. <laughs> 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 um, okay, uh, let me just say, I mean, with one point that, um, on, on Bigu's question, I think comparing um, the first and the second term, I think one of the most interesting differences is in terms of public opinion. Um, in, uh, in Ma's first term, his public opinion went down very quickly, but recovered quite uh, strongly. Um, and if you look at um, KMT and uh, Mars support rates, by about mid-2011, it was actually really high. Um, but we, we get a, the reverse trend in, in his second term. Uh, it falls very, very quickly after he gets re-elected, even before he's been re-inaugurated and it just doesn't recover. Um, uh, so there's no kind of uh, recovery there. Um, so for me, I think that's the, uh, uh, the biggest uh, difference. Um, because the KMT support level has gone, uh, gone down, the DPs uh, looks better. And again, Sujan Tan raised that issue when he was speaking at SOAS earlier this year. But it's not really, it's still, I think, at around that 25%. So if not, um, that's right, yes. Um, so for me, that's, I, I suppose the other um, trend, and it's one I kind of touched upon, was that 
in his first term, the shift towards the two-party system was very obvious. It continued for uh, the second Chen term. Um, but there seems to be a little bit more space for um, smaller parties in the, in, the, in the second term, partly due to mainstream party alienation. Yeah, well, a bunch of questions there. I'll, I'll try to settle a little bit to each of them. In terms of, of the, uh, the first to second terms, I mean, I think it, you know, it is the, the remarkable weakness of Ma throughout the second term. I mean, you know, he never, he's been, yeah, he, he did not have terribly robust approval shortly after the first election, and so part of his first term was recovery. The second term has been anemic at best, and you know, we can talk about why that is, and then some of the chapters in the book get into possible explanations. I think they're fascinating. I don't, I don't know that anybody's you know, done a very good job in convincing argument about the relative weight that should be assigned to them, but you know, some of it is Ma's own personal weaknesses as a politician. Uh, some of it is a famously fractious DP, a KMP internally, right? And, and then his lack of roots in that, that's sort of the, the internal dynamic. Um, but some of it is, you know, he couldn't deliver on his campaign promises. I mean, there were some pretty robust claims, uh, including in 2012, well, that thing, especially 2012, but basically, you know, it hasn't really, it hasn't really, you know, come to pass in terms of uh, what, what, what the economic fruits were going to be. I mean, yeah, by, I want to be pretty well by world standards, but people have pretty high expectations, and, and Ma never really delivered on that. Um, and I think he, you know, in 2008, he benefited from the not Chen Fei-Din phenomenon. Uh, that election was a blowout. Everybody knew it was going to be a blowout. Um, but 2012 was a lot closer. Um, and you know, that was the, that the not that thing becomes a what have you done for me lately, uh, which I think hurts him. Um, and I think even in, in uh, external relations, um, you know, Washington used to wake up with a with you know nervous twitches every morning when Chen was president to find out what was going to happen next, and and Ma took that on. So there was this massive sigh of relief, right? But again, you can't sustain a sigh of relief for eight years. I mean, you, know, you start you start sort of saying, okay, well that's nice. Now how about letting some beef in? How about doing what we think you need for FIFA? How about buying those weapons that we took a political hit with Beijing and with Congress in? Um, why not? You know, let's let's see that that move forward. Um, and I think um, you know the the the, the landline waiting in cross strait rapprochement is that the strategy of first easy then hard, first economic then political is you have a great deal of consensus for those first steps, but almost by definition or what the term is meant to capture is you're headed toward things where it's much harder to get the consensus, and, and that started to, to come up. I mean, I felt you know it was BPP caved pretty quickly on opposing ECFA. But still, the argument is there about how quickly to move on to the, the next steps. Uh, in terms of Scotland referendum, you know, every time the international map is rearranged, a new border is drawn, everybody in Taiwan gets very concerned about it, saying, you got this about Kosovo, you got this about the Soviet breakup. You know. And when it goes the other way, you know, when Germany unites, everybody's watching about what, what this means. Um, you know, the, 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 I know this, the Scottish referendum is, is something of an obsession around here right now. <laughs> I understand why. But it's, it's, um, I think win or lose, um, if it is relevant at all to Taiwan, it sort of just strengthens the argument for a right to self-determination, right? I mean, so, you know, the argument is, look, in a, in a functioning democratic system where people consider themselves to have a somewhat separate identity, you let, you let the people in that area decide rather than saying, ask you to vote by everybody in the UK about it, uh, and you try to persuade rather than force. Um, that said, though, um, you know, obviously Beijing's not going to go anywhere near that. Uh, no one in Taiwan is arguing for that kind of referendum right now politically because uh, it would be too explosive. Um, and uh, from a very, very parochial international lawyer's perspective on this, uh, self-determination doesn't get you as much as you think. It, it, it gets you Quebec. It doesn't get you a separate country. That is, if the central government is willing to accommodate uh, a significant home rule and, and, and adaptation to local circumstances, you know, it may not get you much more than a, a full implementation of one country so it's, it's, it's a, it, to the extent that's aimed at an external audience, including places like the US and then people who may occasionally embrace international legal norms if only for flags and convenience, um, it, it does have its limitations. Um, in terms of time I'm getting into international organizations on terms that seem to give up sovereignty, um, you know, it strikes me as a tactical choice. Uh, I'm not so, I mean, I know there are many people who are video more cynical about Ma's up to, but I think that despite all the political polarization, there is a strategic similarity among Li Dukwei, Chen Shenzhen, and Mai Jiu, and even somewhat back to Jiang Yiguo, where basically they all want international space and security for Taiwan, or the ROC, or the ROC on Taiwan is like the 
you know, I guess they cut like every time. Like, uh, you know, whatever you want to call this thing. Uh, and and there, is a, there is a profound and legitimate and perhaps the plausibility of different arguments changing with circumstances. Uh, debate about how you best achieve that, right? And there's a pretty good argument that Chun overreached, overstretched, maybe Lee Dong Wei did too, and the blowback was costly to Taiwan security. There's also a pretty good argument that Ma may have given up too much. Um, so I think people of good faith can disagree about the best tactics and can judge them in hindsight. Um, you know, I think, I think Taiwan's access to the UN organizations, the UN affiliate organizations, has come at a fairly high symbolic price, uh, and that's a fair thing to point out. The secret does it in her chapter in her book. Um, I would say, though, that one has to be sensitive to the other side of that argument, which is even participation on a limited basis with Beijing as something of a gatekeeper is still something which has, has value. Now, it may be outweighed by the cost, but it has real value uh, because given the barriers to certain higher level of formal membership, you know, being present on the international scene, um, you know, keeping the diplomatic troops, all that sort of stuff, uh, it's not going to, to win the game, but it's, it, it's a way of, of avoiding uh, losing it in the, in the short term. And I actually think in the very long run, it may have been in Taiwan's interest to have had the kind of sequencing it has. That is, Li Dunhui and Chen Chibian pushed back very, very hard at a time when Taiwan was at risk of being squeezed to the very margins. Uh, and perversely, you know, Beijing took took uh, the Deep Green's best shot, right? Um, and survived it, and I think that's what's created some of the space and tolerance um, now that Ma has, has been able to thank history, we'll go to that one more time. Um, Post-92 consensus, you know, one of the things I wish we'd included in the book, um, but it wasn't as much on the radar screen, but in, in discussions I've had in, in Beijing uh, and in Shanghai on this subject in more recent months, um, there has been more flirtation uh, with this idea of a post-92 consensus Something has to replace the 92 consensus. Anything that can replace that is going to move more to Beijing side. So uh, the question is, will you reach a point where, where this is seen as too old and too dated? And, um, you know, maybe we can dust off Sushi and come up with <laughs> some, some 14 or 16 consensus or something. Um, finally, the um, uh, um, why no ASEAN discussion? Um, well, uh, I think Hannah would have said, you know, enough pages already. <laughs> uh, we tried to wedge in another couple of chapters. Uh, but I think really, there's a reason this book is about the politics of, of my career. And the things that matter for international politics for Taiwan continue to be dominated by the mainland, the US, and then the <coughs> next circle out is Japan. ASEAN matters, uh, especially matters if if the extra door opening in the free trade area starts, you know, really going down that path. And I think, you know, it's going to be very complicated um, because the ASEAN-related institutions are among the key <coughs> emerging test cases for what these, not bilateral agreements, but these multi, multilateral institutional structures uh, do in terms of including or excluding Taiwan. And so the ASEAN-based things are, are a big part of it. RCEP is going to be another. Uh, TPP is going to be another. And I think those are going to be important cases to study where, where, whether Taiwan can get in the door on these institutions. And the real concern, if I were looking at it from a Taiwanese perspective, is that we are at a moment when universal institutions are under siege. Right? The WTO is stalled. Um, and, and so some of the vacuum is being filled by regional organizations. Um, and it's not clear what that means for Taiwan. It could be better, it could be worse, it could be, I think, contingent. So that'll be for uh, the third edition. Um, I mean, one impression I have is that there was probably more attention on Taiwan Southeast Asian relations in the 1990s when Taiwan was really trying to push. Uh, um, I mean, one area that, uh, where that um, sub is being developed is on migration. So, for example, uh, Taiwanese companies moving into places like Vietnam on migration of Southeast Asian wives into, into Taiwan. But there, there it seems the, uh, the field is, I think, developing quite, quite well. Um, on, on the second question, I mean, my, my sense is actually Taiwanese universities are becoming quite internationalized in terms of the overseas students. One of the things that struck, struck me up on my um, last visits, for example, is, is the numbers of French and German students in Taiwan compared to uh, the past. Um, um, and, and the other element of your question about uh, why do we study Taiwan is a great <laughs> question. I remember in, in, um, um, in, I think it was in 2001 or 2002, Shelley Rigger uh, 
touches upon this question. I think she raises a number of reasons why Taiwan is so attractive uh, to, to study. I think one of the, the issues she raises, raises is the ease of getting data. Uh, doing interviews is so straightforward. S uh, so much data is available online. Uh, I think that, that, that helps. Um, it's a relatively safe place to do field work compared to many of the places that we look at um, at science. Um, a lot of our, of our students really need to, to uh, look at um, uh, risk when they're going out into the field. Uh, in Taiwan, unless, uh, if, 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 if you're going to, uh, it's not really a problem. It's not a problem. <laughs> um, uh, and I think because of Taiwan's science and its political system, it, it's, um, it's really suited to doing comparative politics or comparative social science research. I think that, uh, that helps. We can test theories. I mean, a lot of our chapters in this book uh, do that. Um, and I think a final thing that, that Shelley touches upon is collaborative research. Um, I think we found it uh, really good working together with Taiwanese scholars. Um, for example, my, my Green Party project is working with a, a, a Taiwanese-based um, scholar. And um, I don't think it's pretty fruitful, actually. Maybe because uh, we're from quite similar kind of educational backgrounds. So most Taiwanese academics were either educated in Europe or the US. And mm -hmm. I think that, uh, that definitely does help. Yeah, I think all that's true, and that, that accounts for a lot of it. The other thing is, you know, political scientists are, by and large, change junkies, right? We're always trying to do the delta. You know, well, what's, mm -hmm. what's, what's the dependent variable? Well, something has to change on your independent variable mm -hmm. side. And Taiwan has been replete with that in, in, within living memory, right? So you see, you see this sort of just remarkable economic transformation, this remarkable political transformation. You see just an extraordinary range of external pressures. Right, so the problem becomes all these things are happening, so you're either guessing or you're focusing on one aspect or you're trying to be prepared for it to untangle it, but it, it just seems you know, kind of over, over, like overflowing with, with these kinds of uh, questions. But you know, that's just what we've got. But also, plus, it's just a darn pleasant place to be, you know? I mean, it's, <laughs> you can breathe, you can eat, and all these good things. Okay. Uh, we'll take a final question then. Okay, yeah, Jason. Yeah, well, I have a question about the um, presidential lame duck theory. About the presidential lame duck theory. Oh. Yeah, um, I think that was a quite painful time, a, a, a quite painful time in the second half, but I mean, second time of president, uh, change the presidency, especially the last two years, that there was almost nothing the ruling party did right, and the president himself could hardly exercise his presidential power. And it seems that the history has not repeat itself. Um, mind is wearing, wearing um, Chen old shoes. So um, two questions. So first of all, how do you compare um, Chen Shui and Mind phenomena in the last two years of their second um, term? And um, the second question is that um, Maybe in the last two years of DPP rule, there was a there was a very big um, political frustration, um, and that frustration lasted until the power had been turned over. So, would you would you argue that this kind of uh, frustration to can be will lead to um, the possible change in position two years later? It would it lead to a change in ruling parties? No, came this changing position. Oh. Yeah. yeah. To do that. Probably moving to the monetary yeah. center or even back to the um, Taiwan identity spectrum. Okay, well, I mean, uh, comparing the, um, uh, the two, so if we, we're uh, so it's basically 2006 versus late 2006 versus late uh, 2014. Um, one big advantage that Ma has is he's got a majority. It's in theory, he should be able to do whatever he wants. Uh, while uh, Chen was, uh, was always short of a majority. So it's, it's not really surprising how uh, the fact that Chen achieved anything uh, is, is, is quite amazing. Um, um, but, it, but I think as but Ma as a manager has to be questioned there. Because if okay, you've got a great big majority, you should, uh, very limited constraints, but <coughs> still, if we are talking about him being a lame duck, that does say something. Um, 
as, as, uh, despite how unpopular Chad was in 2006, do still did okay <coughs> in those 2006 uh, elections? Um, and if we look at the, the way opinion polls uh, are for one November, it's surprising actually how the county is actually looking reasonably strong. Um, if you consider how unpopular it, it, it has been, you would expect to get a landslide majority against the KMT, but I don't think that's going to happen in 2014. So um, I see a bit of a, a similarity there. Mm -hmm. Will the KMT shift? Um, I, I don't see any signs at this stage, but it, it probably needs a um, major electoral defeat. Generally, parties um, only shift when they have to. It's very, very difficult. So you need a number of um, ingredients. You need a change of party leader. Uh, you need an external shock, which could be a, a, a bad electoral defeat. Uh, and you probably need a change in the factional balance of power. Harmon and Janda. Um, so, um, uh, well, I think we'll have to wait and, uh, wait and see the, the scale of the defeat, if the KD does lose. Uh, interesting uh, set of questions. Um, you know, in terms of, of uh, the lame duck issue, uh, in some sense, the, the Ma Chen contrast reminds me of the two Obamas, right? Uh, you know, we have a lame duck president of the United States as well, and, and on one hand, he frequently talks about using the power of the executive. Congress won't do anything, and that's partly because of the majority, but it's also partly because of some party's fracture. So in some ways, it's analogous to both Ma and, and Chen, right? Um, so he, he talks the use of executive power. There have been some examples, not so much so that some congressmen are now suing him for being a tyrant. Uh, on the other hand, there's a growing narrative that he's just given up, right? He's just waiting to, for the next thing. Just get through the next two years out of the, any major, major mess ups and, and, and write off in the sunset. Um, I think you, know, you, see, you see that, that going to the Taiwan case. I think some of the, you know, much as, as it's, it's kind of uh, academically shallow, um, I think, um, you know, personalities do matter. And I think at the end, Chun decided he was going to swing for the fences, right? He was going to, to, uh, to try to um, have a historical legacy to get what he could out of this. Mm -hmm. um, there was a nice paper, I think, um, Tom Ginsburg did on, on gambling for resurrection, you know, that theory. <laughs> Basically, when, 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 you're in, when you're at rock bottom, you got a, a choice of, of, uh, of try to avoid the downside, or you take the big risk, you make Sarah Palin your vice president again, <laughs> and, you, and you, you, you hope that it, it's a game changer, right? And, and so what you see in the last two years with China, and partly this was the anti-secession law, which made him claim to respond to China, but you know, that, that happened in 2005, right? And, and you know, then the march toward the two referenda, he's clearly on that track. Whereas Ma seems to be kind of you know, waiting it out, mm -hmm. kind of given up on, on really being able to accomplish a whole lot. Now, well, there are a couple of asymmetries here, and that was talked about one of them, which is I think even when you have a, a party in parliament that is yours that you can't manage, you still can't run against it the way you can go against an opposition party-dominated parliament. I think it's the, the, the politics of that are very different. Um, and and you, you're more empowered in a sense if you are a minority party president, the, a parliamentary minority party president, than if you are a majority party president who can't control the majority. Mm -hmm. Um, and toward the end, of course, the DPP was, the DPP was toast in the 2008 election. I mean, it, it, near the end of Chen's term, there was no way they were going to win the presidency in 2008. Everybody knew that. Uh, whereas Ma, is, it, you know, he, what he does can affect the KMT's chances of winning or losing in 16. It's not long. So he's got a little more of a stewardship element there. So I think it's partly circumstance and partly, um, partly psychology. Um, in terms of whether the KMT will change its, its policies, but that, you know, that's way beyond my pay grade in terms of uh, understanding how on domestic politics, but I think on the, the sort of uh, broader uh, uh, sort of political science compared to politics one, uh, that, that's absolutely right, that, that parties that have been winning don't change lightly. Uh, every once in a while they have the foresight to realize they need to change to stay in power. But usually uh, what gets you to the Alcoholics Anonymous meeting is waking up drunk in the gutter. I mean, it's not, gee, that was too much last night. So that's what happened to the Democrats uh, in the U.S. after the, the uh, 2004 election, um, and, uh, and what happened, what may happen, you know, to the Republican Party going forward. But I think it takes a lot, and I think it's going to be especially tough in Taiwan because you know way more about this than I do. But, but just anecdotally, my sense is that the, the KMT folks, and the, the, including some of the potential candidates, and certainly including people around Ma in 2012 and beyond, um, 
don't believe that the KMT's vulnerabilities stem from unattractive policies to the media voter. Right? It's not that, that, that if we could only get the policy right, we, we'd have a secure majority, or getting the policy slightly wrong will really cost us the majority. I think to think it's much more about emotional stuff and identity and, and, and exogenous shocks. Um, uh, you know, in 2008, it was with the DPS on a trick for stealing election. Now it's kind of a more subtle, subtle than that. But it, I just don't get the feeling that this course is about what policy is going to get that media voter on our side. And this has happened in a lot of democracies with relatively polarized parties, is the game has become much more get out the base than a play for the media voter. Uh, that's not a great thing for the health of democracies, perhaps, but it, it certainly happened in my country, and I think it's happening in a lot of other places. Okay, I think on that note, um, we should um, uh, finish and enjoy some uh, wine and, and uh, get some books if, you, if you'd like to. Um, okay, let's give uh, Jacques one more uh, round of applause. <laughs>